Hi, it's Arjun. So I've now written three notes that do some amount of work on the coal sector. You know, I've, I've covered energy, as you know, for 30 years and have spent very little time on coal, but have really been fascinated uh, and have been enjoyed kind of ramping up on it. And the, the key point has been, what can oil and gas companies or equities or investors, corporate executives, kind of everybody, even policymakers, what can they learn from coal? This, you know, this is the original fossil fuel. This powered the Industrial Revolution. But what is striking and what I've talked about in some of these notes is it continues to go to this day. I think there's a sense that coal has gone away. And is that sort of coal going away going to be the path for oil and gas? And I think there's a lot to question on that. And I today, I don't want to just repeat the notes. It's the last three posts on Super Spiked. I do want to talk about kind of the nature of what may make sense in terms of corporate structures and style of investment in these sectors to the extent oil and gas does persist, as I think it will, in the same way coal has. But let me let me just get into the video here. So the first point, coal demand, it is at an all-time high globally. I know I've talked about it, but it bears repeating. Uh, if you look globally, and this is through 2021, 2022 is going to be a high, and I'd suspect 2023 is going to be even higher. It's been driven by China, uh, India, rest of the world type growth. We are in structural decline here in the US. Uh, Europe, which is this pinkish line, uh, that's probably going to tick up a little bit uh, in 2022, 2023, but I'd still argue Europe uh, stagnating to structural decline. So the growth has been rest of the world. But I think for everyone in capital markets, they're so US and so European focused. There is this idea that coal has gone away, but it clearly hasn't. <laughs> it, it has only and forever gone up. There's been a couple plateaus along the way, uh, but then it makes a new high. So like, why is that? Uh, unlike, say, crude oil, and I'll talk about it in a minute, there are lots of ways to do power generation. Uh, you can do diesel fuel, resid, uh, natural gas, nuclear, solar, wind. You may like, you may dislike some of these things. But coal is to compete with all that in the same way natural gas does. Yes, it continues to make an all-time new high. And of course, in China, they've got a massive domestic resource. It's available. It's abundant. It's affordable, reliable, secure. All the key boxes to check. So yes, it does come with some environmental challenges. Yes, it is higher CO2 when it burns, so some climate considerations. But China has clearly prioritized the positive attributes over some of these, let's just call them uh, negative concerns that are out there. And I think they've taken steps to try and address the traditional environmental issues with coal. Uh, clearly, China is saying the CO2 content of this, those climate concerns, that is not something we're going to prioritize yet. Yet. We are prioritizing economic growth, health, uh, lifting our people out. of And of course, look at this period where coal really took off in China. It was one for one with the economic miracle. 2002 to, you know, in this case, 2000, it was a decade of massive, massive growth in coal in China. And, and I think we're at a point now where there is a presumption that this is going to go away. But why, why would that be the case? If China's population has perhaps peaked and might decline? If the period of supercharged economic growth in China is kind of behind it, wh why, why is this coal going to go away? What, what are the signs that they are on track to prioritize the CO2 concerns? And why would they switch out of this? Again, it's still a massive resource. There's some amount of imports that clearly could be displaced. There are some traditional environmental air pollution type issues that need to be addressed. But I'm really going to, I guess, question the degree to which this is on track to fall off a cliff. And of course, when you look at India, they are a fraction of where China is today. Their economy is much smaller than China. They actually have, I think at this point, the same or more people. And India's population is still growing. And they have an abundant, massive resources that in addition to abundant, available, affordable, reliable, secure, all those check the box items, these are also a lot of jobs and tax dollars and employment and so forth. So I think the only question is, is India going to take off in their coal consumption and kind of take coal to the next level? But all of this is worth understanding. When you live in the US, when you live in Europe, there's been a real negative bias against coal. There's a perception it's gone away. To a large degree, it has, certainly in our capital markets and in terms of the percentage of our power generation mix. But it is Maybe booming is too strong of a word, but it is certainly continuing to grow and reaching all-time highs when you look at the rest of the world.
So let's talk about net zero, because I think it is these concerns. It's best articulated by the IEA's net zero by 2050 report. I'm, I've already expressed all my concerns about it. I'm not going to keep repeating them other than to say, I think this is symbolic of the concerns that are out there. And even for people who say, you know, I don't believe this dire scenario of oil and gas demand. I don't think it's going to fall off a cliff like this. I don't even think it's going to peak. Some notion of peaking, plateau, and then decline is out there. And people might push the numbers to the right. They may say it's not till 2025 or 2030 or even 2040. But there, there is sort of this fait accompli that people assume that at some point this stuff does roll over. But what, what have we learned from coal? <laughs> We've learned it is really, really hard. And it's not even clear any country would want to in their use of these types of fuels. And so again, let's just talk about oil for a second. And I'll go through these graphs quickly because I've been through them before. But there are two things that you need to believe that oil demand is going to peak and plateau, a step change in efficiency gains, and I'm going to simplify it, simplify things and say substitution into electric vehicles. There's more than that, but I'm going to simplify that. New products and efficiency gains. And this is a graph of global uh, oil demand efficiency gains. And I'll just say, again, I've, I've discussed this before, there is no sign of a step change improvement in efficiency gain. Every year, GDP does grow faster than oil demand. That is, I'm just going to call it normal efficiency gain. The step change, which is what is needed to assume a near-term peak or plateau in oil demand, no evidence of that. The other big piece then is these EV hockey stick forecasts. I've said it before. I am personally bullish on electric vehicles. I love driving my Tesla. Uh, but the idea that these are going to hockey stick such that by 2030 or 2040 or any year in between, that they're going to be a majority of sales, even in, in any one region, let alone globally, I'm going to push back on these hockey stick forecasts in the big way, whether it's critical minerals, other metals and mining, infrastructure, or just quite frankly, affordability, uh, ability to charge at home. Not everyone has that. All these kind of considerations. Yes, EV sales are going to grow. Again, I like EVs. It's that hockey stick that I'm going to push back on. So if we're not seeing signs of a step change in efficiency gains, and, and if we're not on track to have an EV hockey stick, that to me is the case for continued oil demand growth. Let's talk about natural gas. Here I think there is more nuance. As I mentioned with coal, to the extent natural gas uh, power generation is a big driver, there are alternatives. So in some respects, natural gas does have to compete in a way I think oil doesn't. With oil, it's essentially do you believe in EVs uh, or not in terms of substitute products. Uh, with natural gas, there are more substitutes. So I think it is going to have to compete on a number of different metrics. In the case of Europe, if that is going to be a source of future LNG, if they're not going to turn back to Russian gas whenever or if ever, or hopefully someday when that situation there, uh, world peace is absolutely what we want. We can at least dream about that. Um, I suspect Europe's not going back to Russian gas. If they're going to import LNG, I'm going to guess it will need to be near zero methane attestations. Now they're currently ramping up coal. That doesn't make sense. It seems pretty obvious. You don't want to do only solar and wind, which is otherwise what they're doing. You definitely don't want to retire nukes. So somewhere in there, natural gas is going to be part of the mix. I suspect it will need to be zero methane. So at least for natural gas, that is going to be a variable. I think LNG uh, producers or providers are going to have to compete on. When you look at China, India, and Southeast Asia, again, you go back to the coal point it's reaching all-time highs in the rest of the world, and China continues to add new coal plants. To me, it's never been obvious that they would want to displace inexpensive domestic coal with high-priced LNG that comes from other parts of the world. Any country is always going to favor their domestic resource first and foremost. Now, there at times has been sort of super economic growth where they've needed to import other forms of energy. That is uh, a place where natural gas is very competitive. There's some amount of coal imports even to places like China. Uh, that's a place where natural gas can compete. And I suspect it is in these areas and in the countries of Southeast Asia and inclusive of China and India for the portions of their energy that, that they import to meet economic growth, that is where LNG is going to be competitive. And to the extent any of these countries have renewables growth strategies, clearly you're going to need some reliable source power to offset the intermittency. And I think natural gas will play a role for there as well. So again, uh, so I'm, I'm bullish on growth in Asia for natural gas, 
But again, I think the, the manner in which it competes is going to be a little different. I think the, the probably the most interesting long-term area is going to be Africa. Uh, one of the few areas that still is having and is likely to experience continued rapid population growth. Now, it's a massive growth opportunity. It's probably beyond the scope of this decade or maybe, maybe even the next 15 years. I think the question with Africa is how much of their natural gas can or will be met from natural gas sources within Africa. Now, the tricky thing, like with any region, is any given country might be long or short. And for the country that is short natural gas, would they prefer to get it from their neighbors? That might make sense. There might be geopolitical reasons not to. And again, so when I look at natural gas, unlike oil, I think there are more alternative fuels it needs to compete with. And I think the way which it competes is going to vary depending on these different regions. I ultimately think natural gas is likely to grow till at least 2040. I didn't say it. I think oil grows at least into the 2030s. We'll see beyond that. For natural gas, it's at least into the 2040s. But there's just some slightly different considerations on how it's going to, I guess, gain share or grow in the, in the coming decades. So let me shift now to thinking about capital markets and how they impact uh, both what companies should do and how investors should think about it. And I have somewhat relied on the point that, at least in the U.S., from a capital markets perspective, the coal sector has never been a major player. That's not to say coal has not been important. It has. It was a majority of our power generation mix for many, many decades. It's fueled a lot of the economic health that the United States has enjoyed. Uh, it has gone down as a share of it. But from a, from a capital market standpoint, these have never been major companies, certainly not in the last 30 years. We could probably debate how far back you'd have to go, but it's a long way back. And this is a graph of market cap. The white line is oil and gas companies uh, in the S&P 500. The yellow line is coal uh, equities. And this is the zero line. We had to show below zero just so it would show up. And my point is simply, these have not been major equities. So what I've been saying is, because oil and gas is an important sector historically, and I think will be again, because the profits are coming back and profits are going to be irresistible, that it is inevitable, is, has been my viewpoint, that oil and gas will regain a valuation multiple, that people will start looking at long term, they'll recognize these net zero doom and gloom scenarios are not on track to be realized. Whether you want to believe them, whether you want it to happen or not, they are not on track to be realized just from an analytical standpoint. And therefore, oil and gas will regain a much larger percentage of the S&P. It'll be mainstream again. And, I, and I've received enough pushback on it that I continue to dig into it. It's not that people, or let's just say for people who believe that oil and gas will be profitable, who believe in, let's just say, my demand scenario of at least 2030s growth for oil and at least 2040s growth for natural gas, for those people who say, I'm still not sure that oil and gas is going to get a multiple again. I, I continue to dig into that and I do think it's worth examining how else can one own oil and gas to the extent there's some questions as to how relevant it will be in the publicly traded markets. Now, one thing I've done in studying the coal sector is I've, I've started to dig in on some of the companies. And as you know, here at Super Spiked, I, I'm not an individual stock analyst anymore. I am not providing individual company recommendations or anything of that nature. It's macro themes. There's some historical company analysis. But, but I did go through the Peabody November 2022 analyst meeting deck, and they have a Vimeo video. And I, I will say to credit Peabody, I thought they did a very nice job and I appreciate their posting it. And I have a chance to have reviewed it. And as I was going through the presentation, it was striking to me how a lot of the key themes they discuss, this is Peabody's management, are very similar to how I've talked about what the oil and gas sector needed to do. And rather than take some encouragement from that, uh, it actually scared me a little bit that, oh my gosh, Maybe for those who have been pushing back on me and have been saying oil and gas is going to be like coal equities, it's inevitable. Um, you know, it, 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 again, it, I think it's worthy of continuing to study this topic. So let me just go through some of the Peabody takeaways. They talked about a fortress balance sheet. Uh, they talked about paying down debt, and it's been a big focus for them. They talked about reducing dependence on the outside world. I think it was around insurance. Um, I, I'm blanking on the term they use, but it was around the insurance of, uh, of some of these mines and so forth. They're facing challenges. We're starting to see that. I've talked about it in the oil and gas space. Munich Re and HSBC going away, hugely problematic in my opinion. But the coal guys have already been facing this for far longer and is, was a the theme of this, uh, this, this webcast. 
I thought they had a very pragmatic ESG component to their presentation. I applaud whoever did it. Um, again, scared me a little bit because I talk a lot about being pragmatic on ESG. And here we have Peabody, a coal company, talking about these things. And then lastly, they, of course, talked about shareholder returns. So all of these bullets, these easily could have been from super spiked six months ago talking about the oil and gas sector. And here we have a coal company uh, talking about these things in their November 22 deck. So again, when I say oil and gas is going to be, quote, different than coal, it's got more profits, it's larger, it's been major, it's going to be a major sector again. Again, seeing the similarities did, frankly, scare me a little bit. So let's just, in this final slide, talk about different oil and gas ownership structures and what is out there and, and what, you know, what are the pros and cons. So I've spent a bunch of my time, and this is my history as a lifelong equity research analyst, more recently an advisor and board director. As a publicly traded company, what is the purpose? There are, to me, three good outcomes. You can be a going concern company that outperforms the S&P over long periods of time, 5, 10, 20 years. That to me is always, that, that's what I default to. I've, I've always been kind of a larger cap type analyst. Um, I, you know, If you're going to be publicly traded, I do think it is to be a true going concern company, not the opposite. The opposite is purgatory, where you just ride up and down the cycles, the returns on capital stink, you do well when prices go up, you do poorly when prices go down, and you massively underperform markets over a long period of time. That's what I'd want to avoid. That's positive going concern we're looking for, avoid purgatory. Uh, there are two other good outcomes on the public side. You sell or merge into somebody else, or you liquidate. No one liquidates. I do think that is a topic I ought to spend some more time on. What would cause someone to do it? How do you make that a viable option? And of course, the other bad outcome is bankruptcy. And I've said, at least when a company goes bankrupt, it's over. The purgatory is really just the worst when it's just the living dead of your existing out there. And so again, if you're going to be public, I personally default to really that first going concern, how do you outperform the S&P 500? But let's look at some other options. Um, one is to be private. We obviously saw a major large cap EMP go private, uh, I guess it was last year, middle of last year. Um, and I think there's four basic options as a private company. You're either targeting the next future growth area. That could be a future deep water play shale, whatever kind of asset you want to think will be the next major growth area. You could be going for out of favor areas. I actually think Canada is an example, maybe some deep water provinces. You could be private. You could be saying, I'm going to buy up acreage in these places that are currently not hot on Wall Street or amongst the mainstream companies. Cost of capital arbitrage is a classic example. At a time, oil and gas has been out of favor. Uh, you can buy proved developed reserves at attractive discount rates. You might want to hedge it out. Uh, you might not want to take on oil and gas price volatility. And there's kind of a cost of capital arbitrage uh, out there. And that's another strategy. The fourth strategy is to sort of return cash to investors. And so I do think for those that believe we could be in an oil prices spike type environment, I do wonder whether the private model of owning assets, long live assets, where you can assure yourself of getting all the cash flows, where you don't have this constant sort of, I got to reinvest to maintain my inventory because I want to be a, a going concern. Or you have the situation where public equities do not get, they, they usually get multiple compression when prices spike. Um, I do wonder if in the kind of, let's just call it super vol environment, whether being a private company focused on returning cash to shareholders might not be the most interesting. I think the final area I just want to talk about is where you're domiciled. It see, to me seems pretty clear, and I apologize, I know I pick on Europe a lot, but there's no way in heck you'd want to be based in Europe. I, I, I just don't, like, great place to visit. I've got a child that goes to college in, in Europe. Awesome, awesome place. Family lives in Europe, the United Kingdom. But as a place to be an oil and gas or coal or, or really any energy company, I'm thinking Europe's not the place I want to be headquartered. U.S. clearly preferred, but again, you take some lessons from coal. You see where some of these trends are going. I think the tricky thing is, is there rest of world ownership that is viable? And again, maybe that's more of a, a private company kind of question. It, it's really challenging for public equity. You can be an emerging market analyst, but it's got a whole bunch of different issues. People might get frustrated with some of our public policy choices here in the U.S. They get, may get frustrated with the virtue signaling ESG and all the things that I spend a lot of time talking about. But you've got some real challenges in some of these non-US, non-European countries, which are a different set of challenges than what we and what Europe has. 
Um, but for oil and gas, for coal, it's got to be pretty intriguing to definitely not be in Europe. And I think you're going to have to debate U.S. And, and certainly in terms of financial institutions and insurance companies and all these kind of things, I think you're going to, at a bare minimum, have to start making relationships with folks in the rest of the world that recognize we need energy. We need abundant, affordable, reliable, secure energy. That is oil, gas, and guess what? It is probably coal. So this sort of ownership structure, I think this is going to be a theme to focus on. It ties into my cost of capital theme. Uh, and whether it ties into having a healthier energy evolution, I think it's got to, because the capital is going to have to come from somewhere. And maybe private, maybe rest of the world, uh, maybe these are the buckets I need to spend as much time on as I spend on trying to get to these great going concern companies here in the US. So I'll end this video on a personal note. And one thing that's been very clear to me as I've been examining the coal sector is I think a lot of us in the oil and gas space, of which I've been in my whole career, probably need to make sure we're being consistent and frankly, not hypocritical when we talk about coal. I mean, from I've, I mentioned this in a note, from the beginning of my career, we talked about natural gas as being a transition fuel away from, quote, dirty coal into something clean going forward, which was presumably some mixture of renewables and nuclear. So that, that's what we've been saying. Managements have been saying it. Analysts have been saying it. And I'm not sure that that wasn't super hypocritical on all of our parts, including me, to essentially besmirch coal as being dirty. Uh, but then when it happens to us in oil and gas, whether it's the Biden administration or ESG folks or climate activists, when they say, hey, oil and gas is dirty, we only want, quote, clean stuff like renewables, and we get upset and we feel attacked. Are we sure we're not being, we weren't the hypocrites all along? We're the ones who were bad mouthing coal? Um, and so listen, I, I think where this goes is we need to judge all energy by its attributes. There is no such thing as clean or dirty, green or brown, any of this stuff. There's attributes of abundance, availability, affordability, reliability, security, and there's environmental and there's carbon characteristics. And that's how I think all of these energies should be judged. And certainly those of us who historically have been involved with oil and gas should not be picking on coal uh, any more than we want to be picked on. Uh, I think the second thing I've kind of learned is, and I always knew this, I don't know why I didn't apply it to coal, which is you got to do the work. You cannot rely on perceptions or conventional wisdom. It was actually some of the best advice I got when making partner at Goldman Sachs, which is don't judge people who work for you or your fellow employees by what you hear. Judge them based on firsthand experiences. Get to know them. Do the work. And I want to apply that lesson to to this as well. It, it's been a lot of fun ramping up on coal, and I think it has made me appreciate um, how it fits into a much greater degree than just relying on the conventional wisdom that it's going away and it's dirty and this and that. I think the last thing that I still strive for is can you convince others of your view? So in my case, I think it'd be easy to turn into a right, a right winger. I'm, I'm definitely not going to turn into a left winger. Be easy to be turned turn into a right wing and just say, you know, and be sarcastic and be extremist. And that's not the goal. It is to try and be analytical. I think it's one of the great things about being an equity analyst. It's not, it's not about your personal opinions. Uh, it is about what does the analysis, what do the numbers, uh, what does the narrative, what do all these things lead you to to make good business or, in my case, as an equity analyst, investment decisions. That's still the goal. The goal is not to be right wing about this. It, I'm never going to be left wing about it. Um, but again, we're reaching all time highs of coal consumption, and China is still growing their coal, their coal, their coal plants. There must be something that the environmental community, the climate community, needs to learn about that. There is a certain insanity to picking on Canadian oil sands producers, right? which are a tiny fraction of global carbon emissions. Not that they shouldn't deal with their scope when they should, when you have coal going to all-time highs. So I think in the same way I've tried to adjust my views, it is my goal or my hope that others will be able to do so as well. Thank you.